Hey, y'all, Scott here. First, I want to take a second to thank all the show's listeners, sponsors, and supporters for helping make this show what it is. I literally couldn't do it without you. And now I want to tell you about the newest way to help support the show. Whenever you shop at Amazon.com, stop by ScottHorton.org first and just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page. That way, the show will get a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. It won't cost you an extra cent. And it's not just books. Amazon.com sells just about everything in the world except cars, I think. So whatever you need, they've got it. Just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page at ScottHorton.org or go to ScottHorton.org slash Amazon. Uh, okay, next up is Susanna George, uh, writing for the Global Post. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hey there. I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, very happy to have you here. A very important article that you've written. Um, very interested to uh, hear you tell the story. It's called America is Building a Sunni Army in Iraq to Take on the Islamic State. Um, somewhat of an attempt to... Uh, redo the awakening movement of 2006 and 7, uh, I presume only as you describe here without much cooperation from the government in Baghdad. Uh, I guess, uh, first of all, let me ask you this. Uh, you say the base is just outside of Mosul. And that made me wonder, well, how far outside of Mosul? On the Kurdish side of the line or really just outside of Mosul or how's that work? Um, well, it was just a few kilometers from the front lines, um, and you did have to pass through a Kurdish checkpoint um, to get to this base, mm-hmm. and it was in this kind of no-man's land that exists all around Mosul now, um, between the Kurdish-controlled parts of northern Iraq and then um, the actual front lines where there's fighting going on uh, with the Islamic State. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then, so you have here uh, General Khaled al Hamdani. Now, uh, who's he? What's his background? Well, Al Hamdani was the chief of all of um, the police in Nineveh province before Mosul fell. Um, he worked very closely with the Americans when um, when U.S. forces were in Iraq during the U.S.-led o- occupation, and he wants um, the U.S. to come back in a similar fashion to help his men out yet again fight the Islamic State. Um, he says that he um, speaks very highly of the Americans. He called uh, the United States serious, um, and uh, he uh, expects that his men would get the kind of help that he says they need if they're going to take on the Islamic State from the United States before they get it from their own government um, in Baghdad. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then so... I know it's complicated. I don't even know how to ask the question right, really. But uh, <laughs> uh, what exactly uh, could you how how could you describe the relationship between him and his uh, collection of police officers or former police officers and the tribes from that area? Is he a member or a, a kind of a, a high ranking member of a local tribe, or he's allied with local Sunni tribes? How many people well, is he counting as his ranks here? Mm hmm. Well, he says that he has, you know, 6,000 men um, under his command. I saw a few hundred at the base. Um, so uh, so there's definitely um, there's definitely a discrepancy there in mm-hmm. figures um, where you actually see Sunni tribes playing an important role would be a little bit further south um, in the west of Iraq in Anbar province. Um, in Mosul, it really is these kind of former security officials um, like um, Hamdani and his men who are the um, who the U.S. believes will be the backbone of uh, this force that will eventually try to take back territory from the Islamic State. Mm-hmm. Well, and boy, the way you describe it, <laughs> I don't know. It's almost like a Mel Brooks kind of thing. The the American, uh, the CIA guys drive away and everybody relaxes and starts smoking Lucky Strikes and, and uh, <laughs> joking around. They've got nothing to fight with and they're talking about taking... A city of, uh, what, a couple of million people with I don't know how many Islamic State fighters in it, but it seems like the Islamic State has Mosul pretty locked down. Did you, did it seem to you like, yeah, okay, these guys might be able to, uh, you know, launch a major assault on Mosul in X many months, or is this just ridiculous, or what are we looking at here? Well, I mean, it's it's really hard to um, assess their capabilities, but um, I, I think I quoted in the piece that Hamdani said that, yeah, no worries. As long as we get the weapons that we need, we'll have Mosul back in a month. Um, I find that very hard to believe. Um, remember, these are the same people who fled their posts in June when the Islamic State first attacked Mosul. 
So um, we're dealing with the with people who are operating at that level of um, command and control um, and uh, dedication to uh, to what they're fighting for. So that's kind of like your base starting point. Um, what they say, what Iraqi officials say, is give us the weapons and we'll be able to do the fighting. But the problem right now is that no one is willing to arm these men because, um, as I mentioned earlier, these are the same people that not only did they flee in um, the face of combat with the Islamic State, but many of them left their weapons behind, which is why the Islamic State is so well armed now. Right. Um, they confiscated, they were able to pick up a lot of weaponry when they took Mosul that the Iraqi army and security forces left behind. And also there's just this deep distrust between um, Baghdad, which is dominated by a Shia government, um, which it seems very, very powerful right now, especially with all of the influence that Iran has gained as they've helped Baghdad in the fight against the Islamic State, and um, the country's Sunni community that's been alienated by years of increasingly um, work, increasingly sectarian policies by the country's former prime minister, Nouri al-Maliki. Um, Abadi has made some improvements in that arena, um, but uh, but he has a long way to go. Um, and you can tell that the uh, distrust remains because the weapons just aren't getting there uh, to these uh, Sunni fighters from Baghdad. Right. Yeah. Well, man, there's so much to go over here. I wonder if, does it look to you, I mean, obviously Abadi is also just a member of the Dawa party like Maliki and Jafari before him. Jafari, now the foreign minister. Um, uh, does it seem like he's even interested in, in doing this? Because it sounds like what we're talking about is uh, replicating the failed attempt to meet the benchmarks of 2007. Everybody said the surge worked, but they never measured it by the benchmarks that were set out in the first place, which was the one of the primary you know, points of the whole exercise was to get the Shiite-run Baghdad government to go ahead and pay these guys to be the yeah. army and the local security forces in, in their own areas anyway. And yet... They had no interest in doing that whatsoever. People pin it all on Maliki, but it seemed like America gave them Baghdad. They didn't care. They said, you guys can take the worst part of Iraq and beat it. And so now they're supposed to want to arm these guys and pay these guys and integrate them in the way that Petraeus could never get them to when he had 150,000 people in the country. Exactly. Uh, no, I mean... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's important to remember that the Iraqi military that you see now in Iraq is the product of years of U.S. training efforts when the U.S. was in Iraq in full force when it was occupying the country. Um, and it's also the product of billions of dollars in training and arms. Um, so to think that the U.S. can kind of sweep in and even in a few months, a few years, kind of build up an army that can take on the Islamic State is, I mean, it's, it, it would, it's, um, it's, it's not something that inspires a lot of confidence at the moment. Yeah. Well, now, and I'm sorry, cause I, I always go on and on and ask too many questions or allude to too many topics in, in one thing there. But, uh, back to the question of whether you think a body is even interested in trying yes. to make this kind of a deal. What do you think of that? Well, yeah, no, I think that it, we have seen signs that a body is trying to do something. Um, that he is um, trying to improve upon um, the legacy that Maliki left him with. Um, the latest instance where we saw some real kind of change in policy from Abadi um, was actually um, getting this budget passed through Iraq's parliament. And um, that showed that he was able to really kind of reach out to the Kurds um, in a way that Maliki really was unable to do um, in uh, last year. Um, there wasn't a budget for the entire year, and that meant that a lot of uh, government employees in Iraq's north and Kurdistan weren't receiving government salaries, and that created a lot of animosity between the Kurdish north um, and uh, and Baghdad. Um, but with regards to the Sunnis and building trust with Iraq's Sunni community, um, I think it's really important not to forget that um, Abadi did appoint a member of the Badr organization, mm -hmm. and this is a Shia militia. With the, who's been accused of horrific human rights violations against Sunnis, um, to head the Ministry of Interior. And that's a big move, an important move, and um, it is one that Human Rights Watch um, has called uh, tantamount to institutionalizing militia rule. 
Yeah. All right. Now we're going to have to hold it right there. Sorry to interrupt. It's the break. We'll be right back with Susanna George writing at the Global Post. You can also find it at theweek.com. America building a Sunni army in Iraq to take on the Islamic State. Hey, I'm Scott Horton here for the Future of Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future Freedom Foundation at fff.org slash subscribe. Since 1989, FFF has been pushing an uncompromising moral and economic case for peace, individual liberty, and free markets. Sign up now for the Future Freedom, featuring founder and president Jacob Horenberger, as well as Sheldon Richmond, James Bovard, Anthony Gregory, Wendy McElroy, and many more. It's just $25 a year for the print edition, 15 per year to read it online. That's fff.org slash subscribe. And tell them Scott sent you. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. It's my show. And hey, look. I actually did the slightest bit of work and found a better bio. Susanna George uh, does radio and print journalism for NPR, PRI, Global Post, and Foreign Policy. A little bit better introduction than the first one there. Uh, this article, I will direct your attention to theweek.com. It's also at the Global Post. America is building a Sunni army in Iraq to take on the Islamic State. And um, now where we left off, you're talking about how um, uh, a body from the Dawa Party, the new prime minister, uh, has appointed a uh, leader of the Badr Brigade to be the new interior minister. And and I, th- I think we're both kind of just sort of shrugging at what that portends uh, pretty much unescapably, right? Yeah, I think by Iraq's Sunni community, that was seen as a real slap in the face um, because this is a, a ministry that is very powerful um, and controls a budget um, with, which it uses to buy arms that is comparable to that of the uh, Ministry of Defense. So it's a very important, it's a power ministry. And for it to be led up by um, a member of an organization that so many Sunnis associate with, um, you know, wrongs committed against their people, sectarian wrongs, I think it was definitely seen as a step back. Um, for a body, um, mm-hmm. in terms of his, uh, efforts to reach out to the Sunni community and kind of rebuild trust. Right. And I forget, I'm sorry, uh, before the break, if you mentioned the Human Rights Watch or the Amnesty statement there, uh, but it, Amnesty oh. just did a report, of course, about how this is still ongoing right now. It really has been going on all along the sectarian cleansing of the Sunnis, but now it's all kicked back up again since the declaration of the caliphate. So the Bada Brigade is, no one's even arguing that they're reformed and that their days of power drilling people to death are long gone. Well, I don't, I don't know about, um, the continued use of, uh, power drills. But, um, but I do know that they are one of the most effective fighting forces on the ground right now against the Islamic State. They've had a string of victories um, in Diyala province. Um, some of those have been with the help of the Kurdish Peshmerga. Those, those are the Peshmerga, um, the Kurdish fighters um, in northern Iraq. Um, and they um, and they're they're winning um, where in other parts of Iraq, um, you know, in, in Ambar, around Mosul, it's um, pretty st- uh, the front lines are pretty stagnant. So um, the Badr organization is getting a lot of um, support from Baghdad. They're getting a lot of weapons from Baghdad and from um, from Iran, although the Badr organization does claim that um, all of their support from Iran goes through Bag- uh, Baghdad first. None of it comes directly from Iran. That's what the um, organization's leaders uh, claim. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Now, one of my favorite questions for uh, reporters on this war is to try to gauge. And I know it's kind of silly to try to put a quantity on equality. But if you could, on a scale of one to ten, could you compare what you think is the power of the Islamic State over Iraqi Sunni stand now compared to the power of Al Qaeda in Iraq at its height back in 2006? Because, you know, there's there's a lot of hope there. Right. People look back and say, hey, the local Sunnis got sick of Zarqawi's guys after he was killed. Uh, and stabbed them in the back and got rid of them relatively easily uh, within the space of a year. So maybe we could replicate that. And I, I just wonder whether, you know, how it is that you gauge the, their relative strength. Mm-hmm. Now, I think it's a really interesting question, but I think it's very difficult to ask, um, to answer numerically. Right. Um, these are two very different organizations um, with two very different um, kind of end goals. And um, while there is a lot of hope that um, that that Iraq Sunnis, um, after seeing the brutality of the Islamic State and seeing that life under the Islamic State um, has gotten incredibly uh, has gotten a lot worse for them than um, life even under a repressive sectarian Maliki policy, 
Um, you know, from Mosul, we just hear horror stories of, of, of what life is like in Mosul now. There's just zero society, zero government services to Crete. The um, other um, major city that the Islamic State controls um, has, I believe the last estimate I heard was that only 1% of the civilian population remain in the city. So there's a lot of hope that, um, that Sunnis will see these kind of poor living conditions and then turn against, um, against the Islamic State. But um, what you're still missing in that is someone that would that will then back them and give them the weapons necessary to fight back against um, this very heavily armed uh, group that's now managed to gain uh, really important footholds in urban areas where U.S. coalition airstrikes aren't as effective um, as when the group was, you know, out moving around in these big convoys and big open areas of the country. Mm -hmm. Well, see, all this brings us back to the question of what the Americans are doing uh, with even to the degree that they're backing uh, this army of, uh, well, even to the degree they're they're backing uh, the Kurds and, and backing the Iraqi government as well as this uh, Sunni army that they're building here of what their policy is and whether it coincides with reality at all. And the biggest question, of course, being whether Iraq is a place anymore, whether such a thing exists. We've created George W. Bush's stand and Shia stand in the South from Baghdad down to Kuwait, and they don't seem to have much interest in attempting to rule Sunni Stan. Uh, that was why they never incorporated their forces, because they said, you guys can go to hell, basically. Those days are over. It seems like the declaration of the caliphate, if nothing else, even if Baghdadi and the whole thing falls apart, uh, dies and the whole thing falls apart tomorrow, it seems like this is still the final declaration of independence of Ambar and, and I'm sorry, all the, I don't know the names of all the provinces up toward Mosul and in in the predominantly Sunni areas of Iraq. It seems like, and you talk about this in the article, how if the policy really is holding Iraq together and this works, this could undermine that because we're talking again about creating a separate Sunni army outside of the jurisdiction of Baghdad. So what Iraq are we even referring to anymore at this point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to back up a little bit and answer kind of the first part of your question and um, get to the policy part. Sure. So um, so what I saw at this base that I visited um, was a pretty routine visit um, by, you know, a small group of U.S. officials who are meeting with Iraqi personnel. Um, and they're, you know, just assessing what their needs and wants are for, um, you know, this uh, eventual um, fight to retake Mosul, re retake territory that the Islamic State holds. And initially, originally, this um, was planned, this uh, plan to rearm Sunni fighters um, was going to fall under this big piece of legislation called the National Guard. And at the time that it was first introduced, um, this was a time when Baghdad was really asking the U.S. to up um, its uh, involvement um, in Iraq, you know, to increase airstrikes, to increase um, support of Iraqi military. Um, and so Baghdad kind of warmly or maybe lukewarmly <laughs> um, responded to um, the U.S. proposal of uh, creating a National Guard that would create a unified uh, military uh, for Iraq that would include Sunnis and Shia and Kurds and would um, help to heal some of the sectarian rifts that allowed the Islamic State to come into Iraq in the first place. Um, at the time, the U.S. referred to it as a cornerstone of U.S.-Iraq policy because it was a way to kind of rebuild this trust. Um, but since then, it completely just languished in parliament um, in Baghdad. Um, and to be fair, um, Iraq's parliament does not pass very much legislation at all. Um, and um, the Iraqi uh, parliament members who I've spoken to said that even though Baghdad uh, sounded as though they were open to this um, plan to begin with, they uh, they never thought that this uh, National Guard plan was ever going to go anywhere. So the problem with arming these disparate groups without kind of a legislation, without a big piece of legislation kind of holding everything together, um, is that you have these Shia militias. Uh, you're going to have these kind of armed Sunni groups at one point. You have the armed Kurdish fighters. Um, and But the problem is, is that the Baghdad can then turn off that supply of weapons whenever it wants. And so there isn't any kind of long-term trust building that will go along with arming these disparate groups. And then, 
even further down the road is that once, um, you know, this fight with the Islamic State is over, if it ever is over, you're left with, um, you know, military that's really just a bunch of militias um, who then will lack a common enemy. And I think that that's what analysts um, and a lot of Iraqis, Iraqi civilians are wor- really worried about um, in terms of their country's long term future. Right. And of course, we don't even have a chance to talk about the western half of this war in what used to be eastern Syria now, but uh, maybe another time. I sure appreciate your time on the show, Suzanne. Thank you so much for having me. That's Susanna George, y'all. She's at the Global Post and also at Public Radio International and National Public Radio. And I'm late. We'll be right back with Jason Ditz right after this. Hey, y'all. Scott Horton here. It's always safe to say that one should keep at least some of your savings in precious metals as a hedge against inflation. If this economy ever does heat back up and the banks start expanding credit, rising prices could make metals a very profitable bet. Since 1977, Roberts & Roberts Brokerage, Inc. has been helping people buy and sell gold, silver, platinum, and palladium, and they do it well. They're fast, reliable, and trusted for more than 35 years. And they take Bitcoin. Call Roberts & Roberts at 1-800-874-9760 or stop by rrbi.co. What was the only interest group in D.C. pushing war with Syria last summer? AIPAC and the Israel lobby. What's the only interest group in D.C. pushing to sabotage the nuclear deal with Iran right now? AIPAC and the Israel lobby. Why doesn't the president force an end to the occupation of Palestine, a leading cause of terrorist attacks against the United States? AIPAC and the Israel lobby. The Council for the National Interest is pushing back, putting America first and educating the people about what's really at stake in the Middle East. Help support their important work at councilforthenationalinterest.org. Hey, all Scott here for Liberty.me, the brand new social network and community-based publishing platform for the liberty-minded. Liberty.me combines the best of social media technology all in one place and features nightly classes, guides, events, publishing, and so much more. Sign up now and you get the first 30 days free. And if you click through the link in the right margin at scotthorton.org or use the promo code Scott when you sign up, you'll save $5 per month for life. That's more than a third off the regular price. And hey, once you sign up, add me as a friend on there at scotthorton.liberty.me. Be free. Liberty.me.